Thanks ever again. But. I didn't hear anything from him today other than see you later. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's getting pretty bad. Central Texas is the place of it's from a sister. That's the only reason I'm taking you. Central. Have you met me? <laughs> I burned my whole life. <laughs> You're darker than me. Look. It's more better. He got a hold of me said he'd be a few minutes late, but he will be here. All right. We'll start on time, and he'll be a few minutes late. I'm not going to go to the training room because I have another obligation, but I, I participated in that last year, so I feel pretty comfortable. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Is it what? Oh. There's a little bit of it, maybe. Yes. Good evening, and welcome to the Crestville City Council work session meeting. April 24th, 2023. Will you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have one counselor, Council President Alonzo Steele, who is running a little bit late. He said he'll be here if you note that for the record. And first of all, mayor's report. So, counselors, I passed out to you um, information. Last week, there was a Lane County um, town hall meeting held by Sheriff Cliff Harold, who, of course, we're proud he's a Cresswellian. And it was at the high school. It was about proposed ballot measure 20-340, which I wanted to pass out a copy to all of you. So you can read through this later, but I wanted to mention that because this measure is largely about funding to keep um, beds open at the jail, Lane County Jail, they're offering tours of the jail. And you'll see that on one of the pages. Um, it says, learn more and take a tour. And so I've actually signed up for a tour in a couple of weeks. They're doing them Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings. And if you go on, online here, you can find out about a tour. And if it doesn't work out for any of these ones and you're interested in joining me, I'm going on a tour with um, a number of people on May 10th at 6.30 p.m. So I would encourage you to consider taking a tour of the Lane County Jail. Okay? And then um, I wanted to mention but my guess is that, Norm, you're going to mention about Arbor Day on Saturday? Yes. Okay. I so will talk about that. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> you will have that opportunity. Okay? You can add if I miss something. All right. I'll add if you miss something. But I'm <laughs> sure you probably won't. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So that covers my mayor's report. So we're going to go to administration and finance. And I know Alonzo's got one of these committees, but... Uh, Who's, who's administration finance? Is that Alonzo? Yeah. Okay. If he gets here before we finish all of the reports, we'll loop back to him. Okay. So we we'll go to public safety committee. That's me. And we didn't meet this month. We're on track for our next meeting, and we really have our ducks in a row this year for the National Night Out. So good. We're really looking forward to it. Thank you. You betcha. Okay. Transportation and Public Works Committee. Uh, we there's no report tonight. Okay. Parks and Tree Advisory, yeah, Norma. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited about the, the Arbor Day this year. We're going to have a really fun time. There's a lot of people that have, have um, said yes to being there. Uh, unfortunately, the um, one that we were looking forward to 
Kona Ice is not going to be there after all. They backed out. Um, there's an e is it, the email's not in here, is it? Okay. We received an email, and I didn't bring it with me, from Shannon Romo, requesting a park for middle school aged kids. So we'll have to consider how we might be able to incorporate that into the parks we already have. I, I don't know. Uh, it's something for the future to think about. Not something we're able to do now. Unless somebody wants to donate a park. No. Um, we did some revisions on our budget request, which have gone into the budget committee, which um, we don't need to go into right now. It'll come out in the budget committee. Um, we have been, the bird houses that we were hoping to have and got bids on have been donated by the, what school was that? The Kennedy? school that's, yeah. Kennedy High School in, in, in Saginaw. In Saginaw, they, they had a grant mm -hmm. to pay for the materials and they they uh, made birdhouses for us. Really? Wow. It's just pretty exciting for all of us. Um, and uh, let's see. Curtis came in and we talked about developing a tree care replacement policy in a farm and it's still in the process. It'll take a while. You know. it, uh, it, we wanted to have a review by the Park and Tree Advisory Committee and focus on street trees. And um, there's a conflict between the municipal code and the development code and regarding the removal and replacement of trees. Curtis recommends that regulations be located in the municipal code for the trees only. And he'll be work he's working on the, the language for that. And, he'll, and it will be reviewed by the city council when it's ready to, to be presented. Um, uh, develop a long-range treatment plan, which is part of our assignment. Um, Public Works has a budget for replacing and, and, and trimming trees every year, and um, the trees are inspected and pruned yearly, so they have some sort of aspect, idea of what, need, what will need to be replaced in the near future. And that's not a lot of money for replacing trees, but... Um, it's, it's, under, it's part of our, our city plan anyway. Uh, we talked about developing and maintaining inventory of trees. Uh, we recommend we should take that, take that out of the tree care plan because it's not useful or feasible at this time to do that. Um, we, we discussed the ways that we've already been talking about for um, improving the parks, the bulletin board, and the bird and bat houses and butterfly gardens. Um, we can't move forward on any of that until budget, until we have the budget for that. Um, the Watershed Council planted 1,500 trees and shrubs in Garden Lake Park recently. So 1,500? 1,500. Oh, wow. That's, that's quite a bit. And this was due to an Arbor Day Foundation grant. $2,600 worth of trees and shrubs. That's pretty awesome. Oh, and we would like to invite Mayor Stram, Strom, Stram, to, Stram, to read the Arbor Day pro pro Proclamation at the Arbor Day Celebration at 11.30 a.m., if you're able. 11.30? I had down 11 o'clock. Well, it starts at 11. Starts at 11. I'll be there at 11. Okay, so. I'll read it at 11.30. Somewhere in that. So that people have enough time to get there and they all can hear you. Okay. It's a pretty awesome proclamation. Uh, we'll have free trees to give away. 20 have been purchased to give us prizes at drawings every 15 minutes during Arbor Day. Uh, we have live music. Uh, Peter Osborne, who is a member of the Park and Tree Advisory Committee, is providing them the uh, music. Everything's set up for getting a stage or an electricity out there where he needs it. Um, there's going to be free pa face painting. It's been donated by a, a member of our Park and Tree Advisory Committee. Uh, he provided the, the cash for, for the person who's doing the face painting. 
So there's two hours, right? Two hours of face, free pay, face paintings. Of course, the, the duck truck's going to be there. I'll just mention a few of them. The Creswell Library is going to be there. Um, Oregon Department of Forestry is going to provide information on Emerald Ash Borer. Of course, the Park and Tree Committee will be there. We'll have different activities and free things and sign-up sheet for free for Friends of the Creswell Park, uh, walking maps, uh, disc golf display. We'll have a lot of things going on with, our, with us. Um, they're prepared to plant a tree. Do you know anything about what kind of tree it is? Do you know what tree they're planting? Uh, I think they're maple. Okay, a maple tree. The kids loved it the last time we were able to do that. Even little tiny kids who put the dirt in there. Anyway, everyone come, we're gonna have so much fun. What kind of trees are you giving away, Mama Jean? She's Crepe, a, myrtle, and maples. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, Airport Commission. <coughs> and we're also going to let you give an Administration Finance Committee report if you have one. I don't have much to say except uh, keep your court dates on your radar. And that's it for that. And okay. so I'll jump into the uh, airport. We met April 19th for a regular quarterly uh, agenda meeting and uh, we, Manager Humble gave us a bunch of updates on the poor grants, so I'll share some of that with you guys so you know what's going on. Um, the uh, EOC core grant is going to be closed by the end of the month and there were some items that were purchased for the EOC, some tables and chairs, refrigerators, water, and other supplies. And then the other grant, the kind of the next big pro project that's coming um, down the pike is the grant for the North Taxi Lane Project. And it's actually the accumulation of five grants that will go for that project. And I, I think right now we're just, uh, Manager Humble's just waiting for the final report from the consultants, and then it goes to the FFA for approval. Correct? We're waiting for the final report for the EPA, uh, which is a prerequisite to get the FAA grants. So, so we're waiting for the consultant to give us <coughs> that report to get to the FAA to approve, and then we will write the other three grants to start the project. And the five, the five of those are already approved, right? But they're just waiting for the approval for the, from the consultants, so. We have to get the FAA approval of the project before we can write those grants, yes. So before we can accept them. So hopefully that project will be ready, shovel ready by July 1st, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be good. And then the runway design construction update, it's right now the airport's currently closed right now because they're working on the Pape lights. Um, and that company has been dealing with weather and working on Saturdays to try to stay on schedule. And I think you mentioned hopeful to be open by Friday, but more than likely it's going to be May 1st or 2nd. But we've got great weather um, this week, so hopefully that's in their favor. And then the wastewater design, uh, that has been completed. And there is a, uh, a tent to bid out right now, which will close May 15th. And then they have the, the consultants will look over those bids and make sure everything is complete and ready to go. And then hopefully an intent to award will be at the June council meeting. So hopefully that, uh, that project could potentially start at the beginning of the fiscal year. So that's another good, good project that's right around the corner. And then uh, new business, uh, kind of uh, back up just a little bit. We had a work session for the strategic plan prior to this. I try to lump it all in, in, in one. So then, the, then at the regular meeting, the commission voted to move the strategic plan to bring it to the council after we looked it over, talked about it. And you'll hear a little bit more of that from, you know, we'll open up the questions and answers. That's the packet, it's in your packet. And the commissioners are here, manager Humble's here. We'll talk about that again in a second. And then we had a uh, brief discussion on the 23-24 budget draft. And, and there was a few events that are being planned for the airport. The Young Eagles will be again at the 4th of July parade, which is 
cool. And then we talked a little bit about a open house, some sort of open house, um, trying to plan that for July or August, M maybe some kind of uh, like a ribbon cutting ceremony, uh, then we invite the counselors or open to the public. Uh, that's still kind of in the works and kind of show off the new new airport, the runway and all that. Um, so, um, yeah, that's uh, about all that we had there. So now we'll open, we can talk about the um, strategic plan. So if you guys have any questions or comments and so forth, uh, manager. And I believe that Chair Oblasso is going to speak first. Good evening, Mayor and Counselors. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this evening. I uh, want to give you, I have a couple of comments on our process. Uh, we've met several times. Uh, we've had three public uh, sessions where we've taken input on ideas about what should be in a strategic plan for the Crestville Airport. Um, we've gotten to the point where uh, we, we received, we think, all the input we're going to, except for one, and that's uh, we would like input from the council when you have a chance to kind of uh, digest what we've uh, thought about and have in front of you. So we're, we're still labeling this as a draft until you've had a chance to look at it and give us some more comments, your own comments on it. Um, so uh, I'm going to have some help today. Uh, basically, we've got uh, four different areas that we cover in the plan. Uh, financial, which you've heard a lot about grants and all that. There's a lot of financial work that goes on at the airport. Uh, the facilities, actual construction uh, that uh, Councilor Castillo uh, spoke about. Uh, community benefit, also, you know, some of the things that uh, we talked about having open houses and and all that. that that kind of falls into that category and then disaster response and the information that you received about um, the EOC and uh, the equipment that's coming in for that is all kind of in that area so um, so we, we laid out a little uh, color chart a Gantt chart of uh, what we expect to happen over this coming five-year period um, in general um, as in most of these plans, you got a lot a good definition on the things that are right close to you and a little less definition on the things that are a few years out. So um, you'll, you'll see that in here. Um, first couple of years of the plan is really a lot of uh, construction work, things that we already have uh, financed or you know, are in, pro in process uh, in one way or another. Uh, we have a, a anomaly here in this particular five-year period where there's a FAA mandated master planning process that will occur about almost two years into it and so whatever we expect to do here we're thinking is a is kind of a, a transitional phase because the FAA process requires a lot of public input on, a ma on master planning for the um, airport and it would um, sort of kind of cause us to have to go back and relook at all the things that, that we proposed here. Many of the ideas that we received from the public um, uh, that we, we didn't already have planned to uh, execute on within the next year or two, we, we've kind of booted that into the master planning process. So those will, that'll all be good input that'll be used for that process. Um, but in the meantime, uh, as you'll see here, we've got a lot of uh, work going on um, and uh, which is, I would call more execution type work or construction work uh, than maybe planning work. So uh, that's kind of what's taken up in the near term here. So I think with that, uh, I can turn it over to one of my colleagues here. Um, so are we, are we going to do the financial? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hello. So in the financial, um, some of the things we talked about at the different meetings is to continue to maximize federal dollars for the qualifying airport facilities. So how can we get grants? How can we get other monies into the airport um, that are federally funded stuff? Um, some of the things at the airport under the financial stuff, um, strategically, there's some longer term leases that are coming due. So 40 year leases, 30 year leases that are coming due. 
and at some point there has to be a strategy made to how are those leases going to be rewritten what's the policy and procedures for those leases after the 40-year period how's the city going to address that and what is it what exactly is that going to look like and that's a bigger one coming up um, final, um, finalizing plans for the new hangers so there's three rows of hangers getting put in I think it's 12 total coming in um, T there's three rows of T hangers each T hanger has well, the two traditional T's have 10 um, units in each one, uh, and the squares have yeah. six. So maybe 26 hangers kind of range is going to go in. There's a waiting list right now at the airport in the 40 range for people that are wanting those hangers. And then outside in the community, constantly people are, people are looking for inside closed space. And so I have no doubt that the second those hangers are fi finished, they're going to completely fill up again. And so that'll be good for the city because it'll be new revenue for the city. Um, and for the financial, I think that's pretty much covers kind of the bullet points there. So the hangar, I mean, is, is that on page three where it talks about uh, midway down, item number four, 2026? Yeah. we're looking at in terms of building new hangars? Yep, and that, yeah, that's kind of the time frame. It's kind of slow. There's several steps that go in the way to make that happen, but that's kind of the timeline we're talking about. And then continuing to educate the public and the surrounding area about, okay, these new, new hangers are coming at Cresswell. How do you get on the list? Call the Cresswell Airport and say, hey, I'm looking for a hanger. And you were saying that it's um, the potential for new revenue for the city. Yep. Um, will that revenue fall under the rules that it can only be spent at the airport? Yeah, okay. the, okay. the airport is an enterprise fund. Okay. So that means any money it makes goes right back into it, just like a business. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, so we're slated to build in 2026. We're utilizing bill money, uh, uh, bipartisan infrastructure law money. Um, so it is money that we won't have to um, find in the budget. Well, there may be a 10% match. The FAA is still trying to figure that part out. And I will be going after core grants and connect Oregon grants to see if we can't build them sooner but 2026, the FAA's fiscal year 2026, which starts in October, um, is the earliest we can get the last $159,000 from the FAA. So we need to wait to build. Although Jim and I have been talking about um, what other possibilities, whether or not we go for conventional loan and then pay it back with the bill money when we receive it. So that's just our target date. By then we will be hopefully shovel in the ground to build those in 2026 but if we can find an avenue or funding to build them sooner we will but the project right now is the taxi lanes it's going to take us until the fall we're going to break ground july this year close probably the end of spring of next year so we need to have that infrastructure in prior to um, starting to look at the design and build of the tea hangers so then with regard to the wastewater yes. plant, what's that going to look like at the airport in terms of bathrooms? Where are the bathrooms? Um, I mean, is there going to be like a public facility out there? Or is there going to be wastewater for every hangar available? What's that going to look like? So the tentative design right now that we, I have been working with the consultant to design is the first row of tea hangers, which is closest to the runway. Um, they're tea hangers, but on the very end, we would have two bathrooms and a shower so that the north end users could utilize that bathroom when they're there. So the skydivers, anybody up in the north hangers would be able to utilize that. D1, which is statewide contracting, it's the furthest north hanger, already has a septic and a well. So that, lot, that septic will um, be connected to the new system, as well as the main building that has a septic and a well will be connected to the new system. So we'll have at least two new bathrooms on the end. And then all the businesses on the field on the north end will have the ability to hook up to the wastewater system. But the caveat is we still have to work on the water for the airport. This is just the wastewater. Won't the um, offices, the bathrooms in the offices be connected as well? Correct, the main building. The main yes. building. Yeah. Sorry, I call it the main building, the offices that we have. 
So then with 40 people in line, we're, we're hoping that they'll still be in line, that they won't get impatient and go someplace else? Is there someplace else to go to? I think the need is high, and I think that, the, I mean, the sooner the better, obviously, but I think the need is high, and I think it's continuing to get higher and higher, so I think the whenever the buildings get there, they're going to fill up. And Eugene is trying to... Um, interest their general aviation to go other places mm -hmm. rather than Eugene Airport right now. So they're right now in a tuffle with the general aviation tenants um, about leases and cost. Um, I know I've talked to several people that they've tripled their monthly fee. And so the, if, if I had five rows of tea hangers right now, I could fill them. So the kind of the delay for us is a combination of needing to get the um, taxi lane done, needing to get the wastewater in, and then either coming up with an alternative source of funding or waiting until 2026. Correct. Mm -hmm. So this this coming fiscal year, will the purview, the spotlight will be on the wastewater, which hopefully it will be done by the end of the fiscal year, and also the taxi lane should be done by the end of the fiscal year. So we could realistically, 24-25, fiscal year, we could look at the other kind of financing we could put together to build those hangars. But we have guaranteed money in 2026. Yeah, we've been talking about a construction loan. So taking out a construction loan to actually do the construction and then paying it back with grant funds. See if we can do that. So we can shorten that timeline a little bit. Is, is there any risk doing that? Is there any any possibility at all the grant funds could go away? The bill money is guaranteed. We were received five years of bill money, and that can be used for debt service. So our first year, we got 159000 Our second year, we're getting 145000 So they've adjusted the amount a little bit but we still have three additional years guaranteed. And that is ours, they can't take that from us. Guaranteed at a rate or just guaranteed in general? Guaranteed that we will have that grant. <clears throat> will the wastewater that we're putting in, will it be expandable? I mean, if we add 40 more hangers and we have a, a greatly growing population out there will the wastewater system we're putting in will it is it such that we can expand it and get more hookups I, I think cliff is probably the person who can answer that question the best but when we started down this road we were looking at an orenco system and those are expandable they're modular so you just put in a new module um, if you need it but i don't think we're planning on expanding it in the, down the road i think we're planning on building it to a capacity to serve what we already know will be there, but Cliff might have something to add. Yeah, the, as Michelle said, the Renko systems are, they're compatible for expansion. You can basically add on to them and make them larger. <coughs> the, what is keeping it at the, at the capacity it is now is actual, uh, permitting through the county so you have if you go beyond a certain amount of flow you have to permit it as a public facility and basically operate it as like a municipal site right now it's kind of a, a private system that can be uh, maintained by the airport and so if we want to expand it'll have it'll be a, a permitting issue to expand it but the capacity for expansion is there if we need it so will the cost of it be covered by airport users? Like we have a wastewater system and the users pay for it, certain fees per month. Is that how we're thinking it's gonna be funded at the airport? Yeah, there'll be a monthly fee for the people who are connected that will offset the cost of the operation of the plant. And the system was designed when we had thought a um, manufacturing company was coming in. So we have designed it to as high as we possibly can um, with an amount of people without having to go to the next level of uh, permitting. So we have plenty of room for what we think is gonna be coming in the next five years. 
Well, I've asked a lot of questions. What about other counselors? Do you have questions? If we did a construction loan and our, we have the grant funding, will the interest on that loan be included in the grant funding so we're not paying anything out of pocket? Right. We would, we would have to do it that way because the airport just doesn't make enough, enough. profit to cover interest beyond what a grant would provide. But, I mean, these are all several <laughs> steps. They've been, t uh, the, everyone I've talked to at the airport, the previous owners of buildings and stuff, they were 30 years ago said, someday we're going to get water and sewer at the airport. And so it's finally happening, which is a really exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And you look at all the improvements at the runway. I mean, these are so small incremental steps, but they're big things for the airport to solidify and continue for the future. Mm -hmm. But I think for the facilities, I think. You guys have all talked about it. And what are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, you guys have covered it. Well, we can, if you know, we can jump into community benefit if you want. And if I may, yeah. Kyle Bushman, Airport Commissioner, and Pat Dodson, Airport Commissioner. Um, Mike Anderson is gone. He has, his wife ended up with COVID, so he's out right now. And then Alonzo is our <coughs> admin for council. And so the community benefit and kind of some of the different ideas in the master plan that we kind of talked about. Um, engage in the public and the master plan process, so keep getting input. And some of the things we got during that input, um, obviously it's been a wet winter this year, but how are the fire seasons going to be in the future? Can we attract helicopter operators to Crestwell to stage? That means they're buying fuel, they're using hotels. How can we bring those people in? And one of the things that was talked about was a parallel grass runway. So a lot of times these helicopters, they land and stage, and they kind of have the crew trucks and all this different stuff. And so it... Is it feasible to put in a parallel grass runway that then would attract firefighters to come and use this as a staging area? It's close to I-5. There's a lot of benefit for them on and off getting to the airport. Um, that's kind of some, one of the things we talked about. Um, extension of the existing runway. Um, what does that look like to attract bigger airplanes coming into Cresswell? Um, there's a piece of property that can, we could add an extension on. Um, then the Crestwell School District, so the STEM program, they have Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday classes. I think it's 1230 to 2, so they're getting a lot of, they have a full-time staff um, teacher that's giving classes on that, and we're talking about uh, in May, they're going to bring the students down to the, to the airport and kind of go on a tour of the airport, look at different businesses, and kind of start making that connection so we can get the high school kids to the airport and kind of figure out how that's going to work with the bus bar and transportation and get that stuff rolling. Um, uh, increased number and scope of airport events. So getting the public to the airport, showing the public, how do I come to the airport? Where where can I sit and park to watch airplanes and kind of getting people comfortable there? And we can do that through events. And how do we piggyback those events for other things? And we talked about safety. I mean, could we do um, uh, fire extinguisher training? Could we do CPR? Kind of how could we have some kind of day where we get to bring users in, but then also use that time while everyone's there to do some kind of safety stuff? We talked about that, which would benefit the community. Um, greater involvement, so there's an EAA chapter at the airport. So making that connection between the EAA chapter, the STEM program, and the city. How can we, those are, it's Experimental Airplane Association, and so they have a chapter, a group of guys that get together monthly. How can we kind of keep, keep that relationship going and keep those guys encouraged to promote the airport, which they obviously will. Um, STEM, greater involvement. Um, so one of the things for the Crestwell School District is um, looking at different ways for obtaining funding for an aircraft build project. So what would that look like for those students to build an airplane? Or do you start with a small piece and then you kind of grow from there? Kind of putting that in so those kids can go get out of Crestwell, go to Lane Community College, become pilots, become mechanics, and then come back to Crestwell. And I mean, that's exactly what I did. I went to Pleasant Hill, went to Lane Community College, got my... Um, mechanics licenses and flying to, uh, a private pilot and then came back to Crestwell. And so how can we encourage those kids at the high school to kind of follow that similar process? Um, community benefit, ham radio. So we have for the EOC, there's a ham radio station that's getting put in and the, the local club is going to offer free training up to the point of getting your ham radio certificate for the community. And so public outreach to let people know that, hey, this is available. And I think there's been a lot of interest in that. I mean, there's already a big group of people signed up for that. Um, I think I mean, there's, there's other things, obviously, but I think that for the community benefit, I think we've covered enough, and I think disaster response. Can I just ask a quick question? Um, when you're talking about the possibility of 
um, having an airport used for staging for like firefighters and helicopters and that kind of thing. Will there be any sort of public input prior to that? Because of the surrounding homes, the, the helicopters are much higher decibels than the airplanes are, and I know there's been concern about that already just with one helicopter. Whether or not there'd be any opportunity for the surrounding areas to have input on that before implementation of something like that. Well, and so with the strategic plan, the airport commission, airport commission is a group of people, and then the city, and so the strategic plan is, it's not binding by anything, it's just a list of ideas, mm -hmm. and so community involvement obviously is really important, and then city involvement, what's the direction the city wants to take Crestville Airport? Are they ever going to be Eugene? Probably not. They're not going to have commercial services out of here, and maybe Crestville decides, hey, helicopter operations for commercial firefighting doesn't make sense for our community. And so these are just a list of ideas and stuff, and so obviously public outreach and yeah. being there. Better public awareness would be appreciated. Yeah, yeah. definitely, because I live over on that side. I actually love the air show. I have my own private little air show that flies over my house whenever the airport is open. I enjoy it, but not when the choppers come in. And there's a couple jets that are pretty noisy, but other than that, I actually really enjoy it. But I know other people don't appreciate it as much as I do. <laughs> oh, for sure, yeah. And giving an outlet, I mean, even the yeah. ability to educate those people that don't appreciate it and figure out kind of, maybe it's the time of day or whatever, and kind of figure out a balance yeah. there. Yeah. And we always have our airport commissions are no, um, out in the paper, they're on the website, and the agendas are listed. So at any time, they're every quarter, mm -hmm. you're more than welcome to come and listen to see what's gonna, what's on the agenda for the airport at that point. Yeah. There's a public forum uh, section, so. Yeah, my neighbor was trying to get me to <laughs> be some kind of liaison or something. Gary Ludicky, he's my neighbor. <laughs> he's a pilot, and he has a lot to say about it. But um, I just sort of felt like it was too much for me personally to take on, and I'm like, why don't you do that, Gary? <laughs> you be the guy. <laughs> so I'm still trying to get him to be the guy. So we'll see. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, the next part of this is uh, disaster response preparedness. Um, and just to kind of review the last uh, plan that we have been working on the last five years has been pretty much... Uh, working on disaster response and preparedness at the airport kind of for the benefit of the community, you know, the immediate benefit. So this is like if there were something to happen locally, um, you know, the, the people would have a place to go to, to congregate, find shelter, food, and so on and so forth. So that a lot of the work that uh, we've done up to this point has been to basically help our, our own city. Um, what we're looking at in the coming five years is how we might expand that to make the airport more like a regional disaster response center. And uh, we're working with an organization called Oregon Disaster Airlift Response Team, uh, which is a volunteer pilot organization. Um, and they're looking at setting up staging airports in several places in the state. Uh, one would be Bend, one is Aurora. One is Albany, and uh, lo and behold, uh, one is Cresswell. So um, thanks to the good work that's been done already on getting the facilities, um, getting uh, some equipment, um, and uh, in particular the, uh, the radio equipment, because a lot of these um, uh, staging airports, they, they're going to operate on uh, an assumption that uh, there's no cell phone communication towers available. They've all been shut down. There's not any communication network. So that's where the ham radio operators would come in. Uh, they would operate um, ham radio stations here at our airport and basically um, be providing information and getting information on what's going on throughout the southern part of the state. Basically, these are set up to handle bend on the east side Aurora North, Albany Central, Crestwell South. So in exercises that have been done so far, uh, we've served communities like um, Roseburg, Myrtle Creek, uh, Arcata, uh, Bandon, uh, a couple others in there. So, uh, but that's, that would be the footprint of the Crestwell Staging Airport. So in order for that to happen, uh, you, I mentioned you, uh, radio operations, some warehousing capability. We probably keep some supplies uh, on site here, some non-perishables, some medical supplies, um, and that kind of thing. 
And so um, what happens is that we have working with a bunch of volunteer pilots from not just Crestwell, from throughout the area. Um, the big strategy, the large strategy, is that all the federal supplies and the military supplies all be coming into one of three airports, uh, Hillsboro, uh, Salem, and Eugene. So we're kind of well located here just to, you know, get a truck down here, if we can get equipment, you know, federal equipment or supplies here, then we can get it distributed throughout the state. So we, they got big iron, we got little iron. So we've got these small airplanes that um, have a carry capacity of 200 to 800 pounds, basically. So we'll put together these, you know, packages that we can fly uh, for all over the state. So that's kind of what you see here uh, in the plan is exploring, you know, just how far we can uh, go with that. Um, we learn every year um, through exercises. So there, you may have heard of Cascadia Rising where um, the Cascadia Rising exercises anticipate a um, 9.2 earthquake in the Cascadia subduction zone, 35 to 40 foot tidal wave, and inundation all along the coast, um, and, and severe uh, pain and suffering. So uh, those exercises, you know, we, we will find supplies out to the coastal communities and the tribes along the coast. Um, and so those are every two years. Uh, we did one last year, and there's one coming up in uh, 24. Uh, and then in the off years, uh, we'll be doing smaller exercises uh, that basically try to build out uh, the capability of these staging airports. So we'll be uh, experimenting with that over the next couple of years. And then a point that I wanted to drive home with the whole strategic plan, this is just opening up the avenue to see it's everyone's airport. And so how do we get the conversation going to what does the city want to see done? What's good advice? And kind of look at that whole picture. And so use the strategic plan as an opportunity to start the conversation. And so anything on this list, start, I mean, obviously not tonight or right now or whenever, but that's, I think, the, the value in a strategic plan like this. Good. Good work. Yeah. And well, what you have is a pretty detailed task plan mm -hmm. uh, that uh, is basically Shelley's work plan, what the kinds of things she uh, anticipates she'll be working on, the specifics uh, over the next few years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Airport Commissioner, for coming tonight. Very much. Very good present presentation. Okay, so. I, I, I just yes. want to make one last comment. Uh, speaking of jets, I think we might be seeing one here coming up, mm -hmm. which I'm, for one, I, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing that. Uh, I learned that the Pape lights, I guess, they aid the planes coming in, correct me if I'm wrong. Right. And they, right. they're Dan White, you're right. The the airplanes actually trigger the lights and they help if they're coming in too shallow or too yeah. hot or whatever, and then they test them with this jet. So uh, that's yeah, that's coming. That so so be warned. Yeah, so whenever whenever so manager humble 55. gets the date, yeah. uh yeah, hopefully we'll we'll get that. It's a Lear 55. There is no way it will land at our airport because <laughs> it will take out our airport. Um, but it, it will look like it's landing. I had several people panicking, saying that our airport was, there was a plane going to crash. Um, we're working on scheduling now. We haven't heard back from the FAA on when they're going to be able to fit us in. But I will make sure everybody knows when it's happening, A, so that they don't freak out that there's an airplane trying to land at the airport that can't. <laughs> and so that anyone that wants to look at it can see it. And they'll do several passes. We have two pappies this year. Or this project increases our pappies from one to two. So they'll have to fly both directions. And then they'll ha also have to incorporate it into the non-precision GPS approach as they come in. So, so yes, it will be intensive when they do the flights. That's all I have. Okay. I'm glad okay. you shared that. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think yeah. <laughs> Maybe get that plan for Fourth of July morning. Or right. well, that be <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Fifth of July morning to make up for all the people that keep us up late. <laughs> 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 Even better. Like that better. <laughs> okay, LCOG, Land Council of Government. So, um, I mentioned some time ago just the question 
there was a period of time that LCOG actually had their office here in Cresswell for a short period of time, and so I had a conversation with Brando Wilson, LCOG executive director. She said that was temporary because they were working on getting um, the Cottage Grove office opened up to where they could house their case management office and senior meal site all at one spot to save costs and coordinate services. So she said, right at this point, there's not a plan to have an office in Crestwell. There is an office in Cottage Grove. It's open Monday through Friday. But she said, we keep all options open. So that was the answer on, on senior and disability services. Those are available in Cottage Grove Monday through Friday at the um, Elcock site. Then, um, uh, let's see. The next Elcock meeting is this Thursday. So I'll have a report next month. Now we go to Shelley, Lane Act. It's Lane Act time. <laughs> um, so we actually had a shorter meeting last last month, uh, or the, I guess it was this month because it was a couple, a couple of weeks ago, um, because we were doing a, an, a orientation and welcoming of new new committee members. So I have a, a little bit short of a, of a Lane Act report. Um, but one of the things that's coming up um, uh, with Lane Act is that they're asking for um, councils um, and the community to come together to help prioritize some uh, some projects um, and so um, that way um, when there's a little bit of funding that might be available or there might be um, you know like a letter of support that uh, can be written or something like that we kind of have that we have that idea of what's important to each community kind of at the ready ready to go so that we can be just as nimble as possible. So um, I would ask for this group to start thinking about uh, what may be the top projects um, and everything that falls under Lane Act is, I mean, that's bike, it's pedestrian, it's train, it's cars, it's uh, airports, right? It's, I mean, it, it's all sorts of stuff. So, um, uh, so yeah, so start thinking about that and, and what that could be. Um, uh, one of the things that I talked about a lot um, was um, talking about like as we think about prioritizing things is um, we can do a lot of really great things uh, with smaller smaller amounts of money in, in our rural communities and and just make a huge difference to the the livability and quality of life for our communities that you know we may not need millions of dollars to be able to make a huge difference and so um, but if we do have billions of dollars then that also makes a huge difference and it's great yeah. um, so anyway so that would be something that I would encourage you all to start thinking about um, and uh, if we have just a few minutes maybe next month in our work session uh, maybe to generate those ideas then that way it's not all just coming from me because it should really come from from all of us uh, that would be great and if we don't have it next month then maybe the month after right we've, we've got time on this but but that's going to be start start to think about those things um, and then oh, yeah. could you give me an example of what kind of projects you're talking about I'm not sure yeah 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 so maybe there's some projects around uh, putting in bike lanes somewhere or yeah mm -hmm. Or a stoplight on the northbound off ramp for I-5, uh, where it inter intersects with Cloverdale. Mm -hmm. There's a yeah. lot of people who would love to see a uh, yeah, I'd traffic like to see signal. That. Then. Mm -hmm. okay. The other one is fairly safe because it has that signal light, but that one is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And this is in anticipation mm -hmm. of funding works that we are hoping to get. Yeah, I mean, if if it becomes available somehow, because sometimes there's construction projects that, that go out, and, and, it, and this one would be more particular for ODOT, but maybe it, it wasn't as expensive as it was originally thought, so they have a little pool of money that they might be able to kind of kind of get in another project somewhere. And so if they okay. have a list kind of ready to go, uh, they would be like, okay, let's be let's be quick, let's be nimble, and, and be as responsive as okay. possible. So, Thank you. yeah, yeah. So, but those are so. Those are some great ideas, and mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's one of the ideas that I suggested at the uh, at the in person uh, a SIP session was was talking very specifically about about exit 182, um, and because that's it's a wild intersection. Um, uh, speaking of millions of dollars, I have not heard anything back about Great Streets, um, and so that means that we are still in the running. And so it's not a no <laughs> yet. So that's that's great, um, and so. Um, as soon as we hear that information uh, or hear any update, I'll be sure to share that with you. 
uh, share that with you all. Um, but that would be um, essentially kind of the jog area. Uh, the goal is to get better traffic signals, uh, to repave, to do some straping, um, right? Like fill in those potholes, right? Add some sidewalks. There's actually a whole bunch of different pro a whole different whole bunch of different pieces that go into that project so like I said still have not heard back so I take that as a good sign that we have not been released from 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 the running yet so so that is that is good um, and then um, the other thing that I just wanted to provide a quick update on um, is we had our safe routes to school we had our walk audit that happened uh, on the 12th of April, so I did the 7 a.m., which is actually more 7.30, um, walk audit um, just in front of Crest, uh, Crest Lane. And um, gosh, there is a hustle and bustle of activity right in front of the elementary school. Um, and it is quite the, the, the elementary school has done a really great job of kind of managing that traffic and getting people in and out and, and managing buses and, and all sorts of different things with that as well. Um, one thing that I did want to bring up to the uh, council's attention was on the corner of 8th and A, um, which uh, is kind of as, as much as you can be like straight in front of the elementary school, is there used to be a crosswalk there. Um, and if you look at the sidewalk, there's actually a curb cutout, right, on both sides. It, it would indicate crosswalk. Um, and there were a lot of kids that were crossing the street there. Um, at some point in time, I think it was like 10 years ago, uh, there was a, a, citizens, a citizen of Cresswell who talked about, uh, came to the council and talked about a number of near misses that they saw because of that crosswalk. Um, the city council took action and removed that crosswalk. And so that crosswalk actually can't come back, to the best of my knowledge, without council action. And so there are a number of kids that are, I think, I think taking all contextual clues <laughs> there that that is a safe place to cross. Um, and there's not a crossing guard, there's not anything. Um, and so that might be something if the council wanted to think about that. And, and again, if that is the correct process, um, is that something that we could do to help create safer routes for schools? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know more about why we took it out because I think that's going to help us understand better if we mm -hmm. can or should do something going forward. Because yeah. that seems strange to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does Cliff have any knowledge? That would have predated, yeah. that would have predated me. I don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was requested to be taken out. <clears throat> the county sheriff at the time had met with the school district to try to make a safer uh, situation there. And because of the traffic that backs up to allow kids to be dropped off, they were, there was actual traffic in that crosswalk at all times, mm -hmm. which made it unsafe for kids to cross. And so with the school board and the sh sheriff, uh, they made the determination that was actually unsafe, and so we removed it uh, at the council's request. And okay, go ahead. The, <clears throat> the ADA ramps are still there. Um, my suggestion would be if there is a, a safety issue and keep kids continuing to cross there, and we don't want the crossing, then maybe we pull the ADA ramps out mm -hmm. and put an actual curb and sidewalk so it doesn't look like there's a crossing. But the, the stripes are removed, and that was the reason why. Mm -hmm. now, now, they've long since changed the way everyone's dropped off now, so there isn't quite so much of that traffic back, backing up, correct? Uh, I think okay. there's still a certain amount of queuing that happens along A Street that they park in that crosswalk. I dropped my kids off there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, still backed up. Yeah. No it's not like it was, though. It certainly improved. I think it's yeah, it, and then so where where exactly is is are these is that before or after the because they have crossing guards out there right now like the volunteers or something and they help so yeah. is that before or after so the crossing guards um, as I saw them are actually right in front of the school so as you come in to drop off your kids or as I guess anyone would come in to drop off the kids there's the there's some um, wide crosswalks essentially in the school parking lot okay. and that's where those that's where those crossing guards are so there's actually not any crossing guards that are on a street 
Um, there's also no stop signs <laughs> between 10th and 5th on A Street. And so um, people actually go pretty fast <laughs> in the morning um, along those areas. So there's not cross crossing guards similar to how there are in front of the, uh, the middle school. Are there no crossing guards outside of the school grounds simply because there are no designated crosswalks? Uh, that, I mean, I, I didn't get to, mm -hmm. to that question, but that could be, mm -hmm. could be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are these things going to be worked on by the Safe Route to School group? Mm -hmm. So that, the, the uh, crosswalk or the, the, not the crosswalk because there's not a crosswalk there crosswalk. on 8th and A, um, I don't know that there's anything that the Safe Routes to School could do because I think it would take council action um, in order to be able to, to make any changes there. Um, but the best way that you can um, get funding and encourage funding and energy is to fill out that online map. Um, and so if be interactive. Um, so there are some things that talk about like, oh, this is a dangerous area. So you can like things or dislike things if you disagree with them. Um, but that shows community engagement. And so that is a really good indicator of helping to get funding for safe routes to school. How do we get to the online map? Um, I think Curtis has sent it out. Um, I think it's also posted on social media as well. Um, but I, I can, um, if you all are okay with this, I can send out uh, the link uh, directly do. to the map to, to the council. Sure, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Anyway, but that was what we talked about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Very much. All right, we're ready to move on to presentations. And our first presentation tonight comes from Santa Pack. Um, Aaron Donnelly. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council and City Staff. Uh, my name is Aaron Donnelly. I'm a Santa Pack uh, garbage company servicing Crestwell. Um, happy to be here tonight. Um, it's been our privilege to service uh, the recycling and waste needs of Crestwell for many years now. Um, we, uh, I believe since 2009, and before that we purchased the previous company that had serviced Crestwell uh, for many years before that as well. Um, here to, I'm here to talk to tonight about a few things, primarily of which is a rate adjustment request. Uh, annually we come in for, talk about the rates um, and the impact on the rates over the past year. Um, here's some historical, I kind of, in the letter there, I gave some historical data background. In 2020, we did not request a rate adjustment due to the potential impacts of COVID-19. Uh, 2021, uh, we requested 2.3%. Uh, 2022, 5% was the rate adjustment. And 2023 uh, is 8.15% is the rate adjustment request. And that is based off of uh, considerable headwinds that we faced. And the, basically, it's based off of the CPI. Um, and each of the previous years was also based off of CPI. So I can get into that here in a second. Um, the, some of the major headwinds that we've seen over the past 12 months in costs, parts and materials are up 25%, our tires are up 28%. Uh, we're in contract negotiations currently with our Teamsters Union, our drivers are Teamsters Union drivers. Uh, we expect the, the wage adjustment there to match CPI as well. Uh, in April this year, the Lane County Commissioners approved a 7% increase on disposal fees at the landfill um, starting July 1. Uh, as, you can, as you can probably understand, disposal fee on garbage is one of our larger costs um, uh, as well. So um, there's another item I'll talk to you about, but I'll jump over that for now. The impact of the 8.15% overall rate adjustment for the most common residential service is which is a 35 gallon trash car picked up once per week. That is the most common service that people have in Cresswell and everywhere essentially. Uh, would equal $1.90 per month, going from $23.50 to $25.40 a month. Um, I've also attached a complete rate schedule showing the current rates and the proposed rates and the changes um, from those. Um, the next page of the document is the CPI uh, information. So. CPI from 2012, as I'm sure you've probably heard in the news and everywhere else, has been sort of, has been very substantial. Um, we faced a lot of inflation in the past year. Um, you can see there the historical data. We use the CPI, which is for uh, West, it's called West, Urban Consumers, West BC. 
And so that means that it's uh, West Coast, uh, BC is medium and small size cities. So, um, and that's put out by the Federal Bureau of, uh, of Labor um, on BLS.gov. So you can see there that the historical uh, CPI, the, la the pre previous high of 2021 was 4.94%. Uh, this past year was 8.15%. Um, the next page shows uh, rate comparisons so of similar cities around the area. Um, so the top layer there is residential services, and the uh, underneath is commercial uh, dumpsters. So. Uh, Eugene there, um, they have not uh, done 